because we're privileged to, this morning to have Dr. Peter Lilback with us. Uh, Peter, as I think most of you know, is uh, president of Westminster Theological Seminary. The last time he was here was about a year and a half, two and a half years ago, maybe. He spoke, and then the next week we shut down because of COVID. So it's good to have him back now that we're opened up. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to Peter's ministry this morning. Peter is a, a professor of historical theology at Westminster the uh, Theological Seminary, as well as the president. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Peter in just a moment. But let me open us with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time together. What a privilege it is to be with your people on a Sunday morning and to have uh, the guests that we have this morning and the guests because of Dr. Walkie's presence as well. We look forward to the ministry of both of them, but we look forward particularly right now to Peter's ministry. We pray that you would bless him as he speaks to us and bless each of us that you would open our hearts to receive the ministry that's given and we pray that it would be to our edification, to your glorification. So we look to you to bless us now. Thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen. Good to see everyone today. It's always a pleasure to be back at my home church in Dallas. This is where I was nurtured by pastoral care and preaching by S. Lewis Johnson. And I've got to know some of you on and off through the years. And I'm sorry for leaving COVID with you when I left town. I would have taken it with me if I'd known better, but so we're all back together by God's grace. Uh, it's my joy to teach this morning from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel. I'm going to be looking with you at the 17th chapter. And whenever you jump into a book without any preparation, it's good to take at least a few moments and remind ourselves of where we are in biblical teaching. First of all, we need to remember that Ezekiel is uh, writing just as the fall of Jerusalem is occurring. This is a tragic time. And you can find his call in the second chapter in which he tells us he has been called to speak to the rebellious house of Israel. The house meaning the royal family, especially the leaders. And they are under God's judgment. Remember, there is going to be destruction and carnage. And that's part of the story and backdrop of the 17th chapter. Also, we need to remember Ezekiel. His name in Hebrew means the Lord gives strength. And so it's an ironic name in one sense because there's no strength for the nation that's going to collapse under his prophecy. And yet there is strength because God's mission and purpose in redemptive history will not fail. And when you look at the context of the 17th chapter, chapter 16 is an X-rated chapter in the Bible. Uh, you can't preach that easily unless you get people ready because it's pretty risque. It's about Jerusalem being compared to a prostitute. And it's in the Bible, so we should study it. But I'm going to jump over that, showing a little bit of discretion since I didn't prepare our audience for that. But I do want you to notice right at the end of chapter 16, it talks about the Lord's everlasting covenant. It says, for thus says the Lord God in verse 59 of the 16th chapter, I will deal with you as you have done, you who have despised the oath and breaking the covenant. Yet I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish for you an everlasting covenant. So we can see that the context of the 17th chapter is Israel's covenant breaking as a wife who's turned to be a prostitute. What an ugly and painful picture that is of a faithful husband. That's the story. In fact, in the middle of that, you'll find in verse 44 of the 16th chapter, Behold, everyone who uses Proverbs will use this proverb about you, like mother, like daughter. And so you see that chapter is talking about Israel breaking covenant with God and Israel's actions becoming a byword, a proverb. When we come to the 17th chapter, we're now going to find that Israel is breaking covenant not just with God, but with even leaders of nations. And there's a proverb that God is going to bring. Not man's proverb now, but this is God's proverb. And as this proverb is brought, it is an extraordinary picture 
that takes the entire 17th chapter. The, <clears throat> the proverb is really an extended proverb. We could call it a parable. A parable comparing, if you will, a certain story with the reality of Israel's history. So let's begin reading uh, at chapter 17, verse 1, and we'll read the first 10 verses. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, propound a riddle, and speak a parable to the house of Israel, say, Thus says the Lord God, A great eagle with great wings and long pinions, rich in plumage of many colors, came to Lebanon and took the top of the cedar. He broke off the topmost of its young twigs and carried it to a land of trade and set it in a city of merchants. Then he took of the seed of the land and planted it in fertile soil. He placed it beside abundant waters. He set it like a willow twig, and it sprouted and became a low-spreading vine, and its branches turned toward him, and its roots remained where it stood. So it became a vine and produced branches and put out boughs. And there was another great eagle with great wings and much plumage. And behold, this vine bent its roots toward him and shot forth its branches toward him from the bed where it was planted, that he might water it. It had been planted on good soil by abundant waters, that it might produce branches and bear fruit and become a noble vine. Say, thus says the Lord God, will it thrive? Will he not pull up its roots and cut off its fruit so that it withers? so that all its fresh sprouting leaves wither. It will not take a strong arm or many people to pull it from its roots. Behold, it is planted. Will it thrive? Will it not utterly wither when the east wind strikes it? Wither away on the bed where it sprouted? We'll stop there. We might call that then the parable expressed. The parable is presented of two great eagles. Let's try to get the picture in our mind. Two great eagles are in the story. The first eagle is more glorious than the second. This eagle finds a lofty cedar of Lebanon, a tree that grows up to 80 feet high and maybe is 50 feet wide, a magnificent tree, especially in an arid land like the Middle East. This is an extraordinarily beautiful tree, a gigantic tree. And he comes to the top and he takes the twig and he takes it off to a city of tradesmen and business and plants it. And then he goes back to the land and finds a seed and plants it, and a vine begins to grow. The vine is planted very carefully by the eagle so that it's by waters and good soil, and it's healthy, and it begins to grow low and spread out and have fruit and stretch out. It's in a place of safety. But another big eagle is there, not quite as big and beautiful as the first one, but there it is. And that vine that had the perfect location and the perfect circumstances quietly begins subversively, subrosa, clandestinely to send out its roots toward the second eagle. And as it reaches out to the second eagle, it wants to be watered by it. And as the water is coming toward it, it openly now shoots out its branches toward the second eagle, basically abandoning the one that put it there. And then the question is asked in the parable, as this parable is expressed, will not that first eagle come and just tear it up. It won't take a lot of power. It's just a little vine. Will he not pull it up by the roots and will it not wither? And the east wind in the ancient Near East was always a deadly wind. It's the wind you see in Joseph's dream. When the famine is going to come for seven years, the east wind, it'll wither away everything. This vine is going to be dead. It's going to wither away. That's the parable. Okay. Now, what is a parable? A story in which you need to try to understand its message. Now, because Dr. Waltke is here, I want to show him that I have not forgotten. He taught us about noticing the figures of speech. So let me pause for a moment and do a little figures of speech analysis to honor my mentor. I won't do him justice, but at least I want him to know I haven't forgotten what he tried to teach us. First of all, when you begin looking at this passage, notice it says, propound a riddle and speak a parable. The Hebrew actually says, riddle a riddle and parable a parable. And uh, we might call that a, let's see, I think that's a polytipton, if I remember right. It's like fight the fight. The same word used in a different form. Is that correct? I think so. I think so. Okay, I got him. I have to have him check out Bollinger's figures of speech. Okay. You have to have a little fun with your senior teacher every once in a while. 
Uh, so I can get to say, I taught Bruce Waltke. How many people can say that, you know? Okay. Well, it's a parable, it's a riddle, and there's figures of speech. And it is interesting now, remember, this is the word of the Lord, and we want to pause in a moment to think about that. But when God communicates, he uses things that are filled with beauty, literary significance. What is a riddle? This is a riddle or a parable, a parable riddle. So you know what a riddle is. It's a fascinating question where you have to scratch your head. It's the same word that's used of Samson's riddle, out of the eater came sweetness. Remember the story of Samson? Same thing, it's a riddle. Uh, some of our children like to ask us riddles. Uh, like one of my more painful favorites is, uh, what goes up but never comes down? Anybody know the answer to that? It's called your age. Sadly, that's true. <laughs> and of course, I, I love some riddles, like they're more lofty ones, like, what do Winnie the Pooh and Alexander the Great have in common? They both have the same middle name. <laughs> no, right? You get, you get it? That's a little clever one. And then there's the conundrum. A conundrum is a riddle that's suspended on a pun. And so a conundrum is a special type of riddle. And then so, uh, when is a door not a door? When it's a jar. <laughs> okay. Now you're being nice to laugh at these really corny <laughs> puns. Thank you. But bottom line is that the Lord is giving us a figure of speech. And so he's wanting us to think, this is a great story. It's an extended metaphor. It's a parable. And it's a riddle. Why are riddles used? Why are parables used? Because there's things that we need to think about that maybe we will not think about directly until we know all the categories. It's what Nathan the prophet did when he came to David. He gave him a parable. And when David was really worked up about the injustice of it, he said, you're the man. And he was bowled away. No evasion. Our Lord was a master parable teacher. And so... The same God of the Old Testament is the God incarnate in Jesus Christ. They were a tremendous example of mastery of language that our God used. So that means we should delight in these things. They reflect him. In fact, sometimes we say, why in the world should I study a book like Ezekiel? It's Old Testament. It's old, dry, dusty stuff. Have we forgotten how this passage started? Notice again, the word of the Lord came to me. As we start this passage, are we remembering that God has determined to let his word be known and recorded and preserved for us? I'm tempted now to go to the Institutes of John Calvin and read in book one, chapters five, six, and seven, where he tells us what an extraordinary gift it is to have the very authoritative word of God in written form. Because Sadly, we, and this is his image, says we look at the world without our glasses. We can't see anymore. They're all smudges out there. It's only when we put on the word of God that we can make sense of it. The world is filled with all sorts of things, and we don't know what they mean. It's only when the clarity of God's word is given that we begin to see what it means. And the scriptures are, if you will, the bifocals for the eyes of humans that have faith to see clearly. And God is speaking here. We should be excited and thrilled to think, I get to hear God's word. It doesn't matter whether it comes from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or Ezekiel. God has spoken. Do you understand the daring and extraordinary significance of these words? Thus says the I am of the universe. His word is here for us. We should be on the tiptoes of our mind, longing to hear the fact that God has spoken. How often do we say, oh, I just, I'm too tired to read this book, too hard. This is God. This is God speaking. This is God's word written. And God chose to use literary forms and a parable. It's the parable expressed. And Ezekiel is using it because he's coming to a rebellious house that will not listen to his message. But he knew this story might sink home. And so the parable is expressed, and then we must try to say, well, what does it mean? So then the parable 
is explained. We find it in verses 11 through 18. This parable we've just heard, now it begins to be unpacked. We read again, Then the word of the Lord came to me, Say now to the rebellious house, Do you not know what these things mean? Tell them, Behold, the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem and took her king and her princes and brought them to him to Babylon. And he took one of the royal offspring and made a covenant with him, putting him under oath. The chief men of the land he had taken away, that the kingdom might be humble and not lift itself up and keep his covenant that it might stand. But he rebelled against him by sending his ambassadors to Egypt, that they might give him horses and a large army. Will he thrive? Can one escape who does such things? Can he break the covenant and yet escape? As I live, declares the Lord, surely in the place where the king dwells, who made him king, whose oath he despised and whose covenant with him he broke. In Babylon, he shall die. Pharaoh with his mighty army and great company will not help him in war when mounds are cast up and siege walls built to cut off many lives. He despised the oath and breaking the covenant, and behold, he gave his hand and did all these things. He shall not escape. Okay, the parable is explained. What, what do we learn as we listen? He tells us that this first glorious eagle of many colors, kind of like a golden eagle. Have you ever seen a picture of golden eagles? Beautiful color patterns on it. This is Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. It has longer and more beautiful pinions. He has come to Lebanon. Lebanon, in this case, is representing Jerusalem because of all the cedars of Lebanon that had built the palace and the temple of Solomon. And he had come, if you will, to the top of the glorious cedar and just taken the top, symbolizing the royal family. And he takes that top to a distant city of tradesmen and business, Babylon, and plants him safely there. Then the eagle comes back, Nebuchadnezzar comes back, and he plants a seed in the land, and he makes sure that it is safe. And in that place, there's going to be a, a little vine that will grow, not a big tree, a humble kingdom, a kingdom that will be under Nebuchadnezzar that will rule there. So what is the top that was brought to Babylon? If you read in 2 Kings, you learn that that's Jeconiah. Jehoiachin is his other name. He goes by both, and he is, and his royal family are taken, and he lives there. In fact, you read later that after many years of being in prison, he's welcomed in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's successor to the royal uh, table as an honored guest, preserved safely. In the place of the city where the seed is planted, another king is put in. His name is Zedekiah, but his name originally was Mataniah, which uh, it's a different name. It's changed uh, by Nebuchadnezzar himself. Mataniah means a gift of the Lord. He changes his name to the righteousness of the Lord, saying righteousness is going to be watching you. Justice and judgment is going to be watching you, Zedekiah. You better keep the covenant I'm making with you. Zedekiah, who is not really the one who had a right to rule, is now in place. He's the seed that sprouts into a vine. He grows and has vows. Uh, uh, bows reaching out. But over the years, he begins to be feeling more independent. And he says, why should I be loyal to Nebuchadnezzar way over there when Egypt is right over here, an arch enemy, a big eagle, not quite as glorious. And there had been battle between these two global powers through the years. And he thought, quietly, if I make a partnership, maybe I'll get a big army. Maybe I'll get lots of horses, and I'll be able to defend my nation, and we can become independent again. And the story is, guess what? It won't take a big army. Nebuchadnezzar's already beaten them once. He's going to come and destroy that vine, uproot it. And do you know the story of Zedekiah? Zedekiah was stripped away when Nebuchadnezzar's army comes to Jerusalem. And as the king is taken and his children, every one of the children are slaughtered before Zedekiah, before his eyes were plucked out. So his last vision was watching his sons destroyed because he broke the covenant. And then he is taken to Babylon where he is slain. 
the eagle is ticked off because the covenant that was made was broken. Okay, that's the interpretation. Now you can see why he started off with a parable, because he said, you're not going to listen to this message unless you hear the story. And then you see its connection. Okay, so he heard the parable expressed, the parable explained. Now there's the parable expounded in verses 19 through 21. Notice what we read here. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely it is my oath that he despised and my covenant that he broke. I will return it upon his head. I will spread my net over him and he shall be taken in my snare. And I will bring him to Babylon and enter into judgment with him there for the treachery he has committed against me. And all the pick of his troops shall fall by the sword, and the survivors shall be scattered to every wind, and you shall know that I am the Lord, I have spoken. What we realize here is the Lord says, I am the one who is judging the wickedness. This is a complicated story, but it's clear that the Lord was saying, in one sense, I don't need Israel or the nations of the world in their politics to accomplish my mission. I am sovereign over what happens. I expect people to honor my name wherever they are. And Zedekiah made a covenant in my name and he broke it even though it was with an evil king. He blasphemed my name. He was already under judgment, his judgment is worse. I have destroyed that whole uh, story of Zedekiah is gone. Jeconiah is spared. Now, there's a significance to all this we're going to bring out in just a moment. But let's note here that we see in this picture, then, the story that says this was the newspaper story of Ezekiel's life. He was reading the events of two global powers pressing in on the people of God. There they were caught in the middle. They should have been faithful to their God regardless of the circumstances, and they weren't, and judgment fell. Now, if we stop there, we'd say, well, what a story. But what we need to realize now is that that story that we've heard expressed, the parable expressed, the parable explained, the parable expounded, where God says, I am bringing judgment on my people who have broken covenant. They broke covenant with me. They broke in covenant in history. There's a parable that men speak about them. I'm giving a parable to you about your people and your sin. But then we find, as we conclude in verses 22 to 24, that the parable is expanded. That it doesn't stop there. This parable, like Jesus' parable, are timeless. They have a significance that goes far beyond their moment in time. And so we read in the next verses, verses 22 to the end of the chapter, Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and will set it out. I will break off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel will I plant it, that it may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar. And under it will dwell every kind of bird in the shade of its branches. Birds of every sort will nest. And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree, dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. That's extraordinary. What we understand as we say, as we study carefully, the Lord had a parable that was meant for those moments in time at the end of Judah with all the shenanigans and con Nivances of politics and the judgment that fell. But the Lord had a purpose in the middle of all of it. And his purpose is going to stand. Now notice how the parable is now, if you will, expanded. As we look at it, no longer is it two eagles. It is God himself. Where do we find the birds in this parable? They're finding roost under the tree. We read that uh, as you look there in verse 23, on the mountain height of Israel will I plant it. It may bear branches and produce fruit and become a noble cedar, and under it will dwell every kind of bird. The great eagles are going to rest under the tree that God is going to plant. Yes, it is at the top of a great cedar. Notice it's not taken 
from the cedar sprig that was planted in Babylon, but it is still a lofty cedar. It is still part of that royal dynastic succession. It is still the top. It's the kingly line. It's been preserved, but I'm going to take another one from the royal line, and I am going to see that it's planted. No, not planted in Babylon, but it's going to be planted on a lofty mountain in Israel, Mount Zion, the city of the great king. That's where it will be planted. Thus says the Lord, I myself, this is monergism. God alone acts to accomplish his purpose. He doesn't need the great kings of the earth or the connivings of people in the kingdom of God. He will accomplish his plan by his own action. I myself will take a sprig, a sprig, just a little small beginning. You might say a little infant, just the beginning of a tree. From the lofty top of the cedar in the royal family, the very end toward which the whole tree was aiming toward. And I will set it out. I will put it in its place. And it will be planted there. I will break off from the topmost of the young twigs a tender one. This is a humble child. And I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain heights of Israel I plant it that it may bear branches and produce fruit. This little seedling is going to grow and become a great tree. It will bear fruit. It won't be like a low vine that is useless. Read the, the lament for uh, Israel, which is the vine it's in Ezekiel. It says a vine, you can't build anything with a vine. You just take it and you throw it out and burn it up. This is not going to be like that Zedekiah vine. This is going to be a tree, a glorious tree, so large and so glorious that it will become a noble cedar. Now, it would be wonderful if we had time, but the word that's used for the noble cedar shows up about seven times in the Old Testament, and every time it talks about the glory of God's name, the glorious name of God over the heavens, the glorious name of God greater than the mountains, the glorious name of God that's greater than the sea, the glory of God that's greater than all things. This is a divine, majestic cedar. It's not just that it's going to be a royal line cedar, but it's going to be a divine royal, majestic, divine in its glory that will be planted. Something that's both God and man together in the royal line. And on the mountain height as it's planted, becoming a noble cedar, it says, and under it, will dwell every kind of bird. Those eagles have disappeared because they're now subject. In the shade of its branches, birds of every sort will nest. Wow, that sounds like a parable of the mustard seed. The day will come when that little mustard seed will grow and it will be a place where others will dwell. This little beginning will be gigantic, touching the great leaders. In fact, all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. All the other dynastic royal lines that claim for greatness in the earth will recognize there's something unique about this royal line. It has a greater significance than any other. We might say that maybe even time will be measured by this one who comes. Every other kingdom will have to look at it and say, well, measure, when did this king come? What impact has he made? And all the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree. Yes, the royal line of Israel no longer matters. The royal line of Cyrus no longer matters. The royal line of Nebuchadnezzar no longer matters. The royal line of any great dynastic succession of Rome that had the eagle as its symbol too. It doesn't matter because there is now a new leader, a leader that's greater than the high trees. And make high the low tree. Yes, this little tree that was so insignificant. Yes, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou art small among the thousands of Judea, yet out of you will come forth one whose going forth has been from old. He will become the king of kings and lord of lords. And <clears throat> he will dry up the green tree. We pause here for a moment. Do you remember that story in the Gospel of Luke as Jesus is bearing the cross? as he's going along, waiting under it, and the daughters of Zion are weeping around. He says, daughters of Zion, don't weep. 
If they do this with the green tree, what will they do when the tree is dry? What was Jesus saying there? Mysteriously, he was saying, look, at, there's going to come a day when you'll cry out, let the rocks hide us and fall upon us, then we don't face the wrath. Jesus said, you think it's bad right now? I'm green wood. Do you throw green wood in a fire? It smokes. But fire's coming on Jerusalem. If they do this while I'm here, imagine what's going to happen to this city when I'm gone. There'll be a great judgment. A.D. 70 comes, the city is annihilated, and dry wood burns, and Israel is destroyed. Well, that's some of the language that's used here. It's connecting us with the Messiah. But we need to see something else as we look carefully. I bring low the high tree and make high the low tree. That is, the little kingdom of Christ becomes glorious. The dry tree, what's going to happen here? The dry tree, in Jesus' words, there's going to be a great conflagration of Israel. But in the prophecy of Ezekiel, the dry tree is going to live again. The dry tree is going to flourish. The dead tree is going to come to life. The dead tree is going to bear fruit and flowers. It's resurrection. So we have to stop and ask ourselves, well, if we see a messianic, a typological significance, a foreshadowing of what will come through the Messiah in this parable expanded, is it possible then that this little green shoot planted that now becomes this glorious, divine, majestic human being that is in fact put to death on a dry tree of a cross, that that cross, which was the instrument of death, becomes the instrument of resurrection life for each and every one that sees the Messiah that's predicted here. The dry tree is alive. Under this sign, you shall conquer. I have been crucified to the world, and the world has been crucified to me through the cross. We sing, lift high the cross. It is this message of the dry tree now alive. It is the dry tree has become the tree of life. The dry tree is the one that lifts high, if you will, the true cedar sprig that has become the king of kings and lord of lords. So we could pause here and say, okay, we have now seen this passage was for Israel, Judah. We see it was describing two great empires. Israel was caught between two global powers, trapped in the middle, struggling to find its way and obviously failed. What lessons might we bring for ourselves as we think about it? Well, I'd like us to think about it under the following topics. First of all, there's some simple personal lessons that we could take away from this passage. Number one, there is a time when we are humbled in this world. When it's not what we wanted, but we have been humbled. And the problem is we don't know how to be thankfully humbled and count our blessings in our humility. And we strive to make things better and we want to change it all. And we only make our lives worse. That's Zedekiah's story. If you look, it says, it says when the seed was planted by the waters, everything was made. It wasn't high, and low, but it was successful, blossoming. In fact, when it says it was set, it's the same word that's used in the story of God planting the trees in the Garden of Eden. The eagle set it just right so it would live. If you have been humbled, accept your humbling and trust God to raise you up. God raises up the humble. He puts down the pride. Zedekiah got proud. Do you know the Lord loves to humble pride people? Proud people are going to be humbled. The Lord resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Do you really want God to be your opponent? God opposes your pride. If he has put you in a humble place where you once had a lofty place, do not be angry. Trust in the sovereignty of God and be faithful. Don't let your humility become an occasion of further judgment by God. That's a practical example. A national example? Well, we could talk a lot about politics here because time is short. I wrote down several thoughts. Let me just read these so I don't get them wrong. Because when you talk about politics in a church on Sunday, you always get in trouble, right? So 
I, so let me, let me just share these several quick points. I wrote them down so I would at least say I tried to protect myself from being misunderstood. Number one, this is a timeless parable in application. While it was for historical purposes, because of its expansion to the Messiah, it stands, as all parables, as a lesson of wisdom for God's people. And so there will be political rivals, and God's people will be caught in the middle. They're global powers, and God's people are caught in the press. We know we cannot escape this reality and have enjoyed benefits in this context as we followed our pledge to be good subjects of the secular power. We're caught between two powers. The church has been called to be faithful in its calling. We can't choose who's over us in the ultimate sense. There are things far beyond our ability, and we're called to be faithful. But are we not tempted to play politics and seek our best advantage? Kind of like Zedekiah, I'm going to play off. Which side should I be? Can we say I'm between the Republicans, I'm between the Democrats? Or am I between the Americans and the Chinese? Uh, I mean, you, you take the analogy. There's an application here. We're caught in the middle. Do we play one side off against the other? Well, if we use the world's weapons of war, intrigue, covenant-breaking, disloyalty, we are forgetting that our weapons are spiritual and they are not carnal. They're not the weapons of this world, ultimately, as a church. So if we live by the sword, we'll die by the sword. But if we live by the sword of the Holy Spirit, we'll live by that sword of the Spirit, even though we may die in the midst of the struggles and difficulties that come. What am I saying? The Lord is giving us a parable to be faithful to His Word first before we determine our political allegiances. Remember, Zedekiah broke the covenant. The Lord judged him for it. Are we violating our principles as we seek to be faithful in a time of political tension? Further, God's sovereignty over his people is not only to keep them, but to punish them in judgment. Zedekiah was judged because he did not follow the Lord. If we think we have it difficult now, if we violate the Lord's principle, do you think it will be better as we engage political challenges. Further, even though his people may break covenant with him in earthly powers, God's everlasting covenant and plan remains intact. Israel's terrible violation of the covenant with God, covenant with the king, both violated, did not stop God's plan. God's plan is sure because he is sovereign. He operates monergistically. His will will be done. God's plan for his Messiah and his kingdom is not dependent upon earthly politics. His plan is greater than Jeconiah and Zedekiah and Nebuchadnezzar. We are in the world, but we're not of the world, and we're called to go into the world knowing that Christ overcomes the world. The messianic typology then here is so rich. I've given you several glimmers of what might be drawn from this passage. The typology is the foreshadowing of the great kingdom of the Messiah. That kingdom will reign. That is our kingdom. It is secure. And it's there that we find our greatest hope. And so I love the way that one of the founders of Westminster Seminary put it when he talked about the relationship of the church and the state. In his collected writings, I'll summarize it this way, where he says, let the church ever remember that we have the courage to declare, thus says the Lord, about any policy and issue that crosses our path because God's word touches everything. But, he said, let us never determine that the church is a political entity. Our kingdom is not of this world. We are not a political party, we are not a political engine. We're the salt of the earth and the light of the world that proclaims God's word. Theologians call that, if you will, the uh, declarative power of the church. We do not have coercive power. We do not have a sword. We do not have power to make things happen. But we have the power to say, this is what God says. This is what his word declares. And that is what our calling ought to be, to say, thus says the Lord. And so, as we look at this passage, the Messianic kingdom is sovereign over all kingdoms and will surely rule in the end. There is a certain sovereign whose global rule in the Messiah will triumph. 
And that is why we are to be boldly optimistic in our ministry and praying. So as we conclude then at this time, a few final theological insights. The Word of God, written, available for us. Timelessly important, relevant to all of life, even if it's from the dusty annals of Ezekiel, it speaks to our own circumstance right now because it's God's Word. He's greater than time. Secondly, would you see that God's Messiah is absolutely the center message of His Word. Even in Ezekiel, it's the Messiah. And I'll conclude just with this thought of the Messianic point. Do you remember I noted how the little seedling that's planted uh, in Babylon is not the one that becomes the great seedling? That's because the Lord had brought a curse on Jeconiah. You can read it in Jeremiah's prophecy. He says he will be childless. He'll never have anyone that will be seated upon the throne. But the Lord, in that same line from the same royal family, will bring forth another one that will be planted that's in that royal family. And so you look at the New Testament, there are two genealogies that are established for the Messiah, one in Luke 3 and one in Matthew 1. In Matthew 1, it's clear that it is the line of David through Solomon. But when you look at Luke chapter 3, it's the line of David through Nathan. In other words, there's the ability to have the full recognition of Jesus' royal lineage and right to the throne, even with the curse that was placed. And even that is hinted in this text. It's amazing. The Lord knows his plan. It's here. His message then is to give us this hope that God is sovereign, but we also should hear the Lord determined that he would judge his people when they broke covenant. So remember that. The Lord says, I am the one that's judging Zedekiah. So our conclusion, God's covenant is everlasting. That's the end of chapter 16. God's covenant, even though it's violated by man and God, will still stand. And that's the covenant that we are in. And so when you come together at the Lord's Supper, which I understand will be celebrated today, is that right again, as always? Remember the Lord says, this is the new covenant in my blood. Yes, that green tree was put to death. But that dry tree, the cross, became the tree of life. And it's the new covenant, because God's everlasting covenant shall surely stand. Well, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for these moments of looking at an ancient text, a riddle, a parable, uh, figures of speech, but yet ultimately are typologically powerful for the great Messiah. But Lord, filled with meaning for our individual lives, give us humility and joy. Lord, giving us courage to be faithful in a politically confused time as we remember your kingdom is our concern. And we stand boldly to proclaim your word in the midst of the confusions of the day. And Lord, we pray that you might continue to bless your people and your word as we fellowship. May we know the good grace of the covenant of God in Christ that is everlasting. And in his name we pray, amen.